Number 5. Mr. Fix When it comes to becoming Batman, a great tragedy is unfortunately an essential, and it normally takes the form of dead parents, and Batman Beyond was no exception to this rule. When Terry's father is given incriminating evidence that a deadly nerve toxin is being illegally made by his boss, Derek Powers, who is one of the series' main antagonists, There seems to be a file missing from Harry's records. Would you know where it is? No, sir, I have no idea. Powers then orders Terry's father dead, and he sends his head henchman, Mr. Fix, to take care of it. Now, Mr. Fix is a rather ominous and rather obvious looking villain, who is voiced by the very talented George Takai. You're pretty strong for some clown who thinks he's Batman. And he kills Terry McGuinness's father and makes it like the deed was done by a gang of jokers. Dad? Which is believable, as Terry McGuinness was actually in a fight with a gang of Jokers that very same day, which is what led to him actually meeting Bruce Wayne and finding out that Bruce Wayne was Batman. Jeez, no wonder he could fight. But when Terry McGuinness accidentally finds a disc full of evidence that his father had in his possession, he then goes over to Bruce Wayne for help, who then tells him to go to the police as his days as Batman are over. I was Batman. Give this to Commissioner Barbara Gordon. Tell her I sent you. But unfortunately on the way, Powers intercepts him and takes the disc from him, and since he no longer has any evidence, Terry decides to steal the Batsuit and get justice as the new Batman. Though Terry's first attempt to arrest Powers and Mr. Fix doesn't really go too well. I'm taking you in for the murder of oh! And so Terry is forced to use a more violent approach, and ends up fighting Mr. Fix one-on-one -on -one in the cockpit of a plane, and as Mr. Fix fights with electric knuckle dusters, he inadvertently electrocutes both himself and the plane, destroying the plane's autopilot. And so the plane flies out of control, and Batman is able to get off the plane, but Mr. Fix goes down with it. And this is an important death, because without it, Terry McGuinness would never have become Batman. And I don't just mean the circumstances that led to him taking the bat suit. One of the key parts of being Batman is feeling a great tragedy, because feeling that pain and that great sorrow is what makes a person want to ensure that no one else will ever have to feel that way ever again. And that's what makes for a great Batman, a man who wants to protect others and is willing to do whatever it takes to keep them safe, no matter how much he has to sacrifice along the way. Number 4. Ra's al Ghul when Talia al Ghul comes to the old Bruce Wayne on his birthday and offers him the chance to be returned to his youth, well, who can say no to that? And though it does take Bruce a few days to decide, he ultimately says yes to the offer and returns with Talia to her estate. Now her father, Ra's al Ghul, is long dead, and Talia has become the new head of the family, inheriting Ra's great wealth along with his Lazarus pits, which she has used over the years to keep herself young. My father used the Lazarus Pit as a crutch. It is a gift, Bruce. One which must be used wisely. And Bruce Wayne uses one of these Lazarus Pits and goes for a youth-extending treatment. And when he emerges, he is young once more. Although this is not permanent, as it will actually take several treatments for it to fully set in. But Bruce Wayne is young and agile again, and enjoys being able to move and exercise freely once more. Along with all the other joys of youth. And he then has a complete change of heart and decides that this is all unnatural and that he doesn't want to be young again. Which, to my mind, makes absolutely no sense, as I definitely take the chance to be young and healthy forever. But most likely he was worried that it would affect his mind, like Raish's mind was affected, slowly moving from a hero to a villain. I have used the Lazarus Pit too many times. Each time I enter the pit, I am frightened of what will come out. The Lazarus Pit has corrupted your mind. But in any case, it's not actually explained. But as Bruce and Terry try to leave the compound, the henchmen try to stop them. Now, of course, these are a couple of superheroes, so they're able to make their way through henchmen rather easily. But along the way, Bruce Wayne hears Ra's al Ghul's voice, and he discovers that Talia al Ghul is actually Ra's al Ghul. I did not want you to find out this way, but I suppose what is done is done. Detective... And it turns out that Ra's al Ghul's body had been damaged so bad that not even the Lazarus Pits could resurrect him. Which of course everyone already knew, but they had assumed that he had died when his body died. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. 
Instead, he had his brainwaves transferred from his body into Talia al Ghul's body, effectively allowing him to live and her to die. Now, whether she agreed to this or not is not actually said, but it does seem quite unlikely that Talia would agree to doing this. You should have killed me. Yes, he should have. What kind of a man sacrifices his own daughter? Rachel al Ghul also reveals why he has engineered this entire scenario. At the time that he had switched bodies with Talia, the machine that he used only worked on those with a close genetic match. But after years of research, it is now possible to put Raish's mind into anyone's body. And what body is better than Bruce Wayne's? Now at around the same time as Bruce Wayne is finding all this out, Terry McGuinness is being thrown to the alligators. But fortunately, he is Batman, and so he's able to make an heroic escape from the henchmen and then comes to the rescue of Bruce Wayne. Though Ra's al Ghul is not so easily dismissed, he has been alive for over 600 years after all. And so a fight ensues that sets fire to the place, and the two Batmen end up carrying an unconscious Raish out of the building. But Raish regains consciousness and goes back for the mind-switching machine, which proves to be his undoing, because even though he put the flames out, a loose cable from the machine hits the Lazarus pit and sets off a huge explosion, destroying the machine, a good chunk of the building, and of course, Ra's al Ghul. And even though Ra's has cheated death many, many times over the years, he did not escape this. And this is a powerful death, as Ra's is a major character in the Batman mythos, and he has had quite a journey to this moment, and in the end, his obsession with cheating death, or rather his terror at the prospect of dying, is what leads to his final demise, which actually seems rather fitting. Now, to Terry's credit, he did want to go back and see if Raish was still alive. But then Bruce Wayne says, Whatever was in there died years ago. Something which was later clarified when Damian Wayne took over as the new head of the League of Assassins. But that's another story for another video. Number 3. Derek Powers Whilst trying to stop Batman from stopping the arms deal for the nerve gas that I mentioned earlier, Derek Powers inadvertently infects himself with the gas. No! And the only treatment for this nerve gas is extreme heat and radiation. And though this does work and he is cured, he is also mutated into a radioactive metahuman. Now Powers covers up this radiation with a flesh coating so that he looks like a regular human. But when he loses his temper, the radiation increases and this causes him to burn through his fake skin. Now Derek Powers serves as the main antagonist in the show's first season and is in many respects the equivalent of Terry McGuinness's Joker. <laughs> Throughout the series, he is responsible for a lot of criminal activities in Gotham, though he is slowly losing his grip on the city, thanks to Batman. And Blight actually takes note of Batman's obsession to take him out, and asks exactly who is Batman and what did he ever do to him. You killed my father. Do you have the slightest idea how little that narrows it down? Now, to be fair, Mr. Fix did actually do the killing, but Powers was the one who ordered it. It's a bit like someone shooting you. Who are you going to be more angry at, the gun or the man who pulled the trigger? You'll hate both, of course, and Batman does, wanting to take out both Mr. Fix and Derek Powers. But since Powers is the one who actually ordered his father's death, he is definitely the more satisfying of the two to take out. Though in the end, Powers mainly ends up taking himself out. His son, who he has mistreated and is too like his own father, betrays him. You taught me by example, Dad. The only way to get power is to seize it. His son engineers a scene that reveals that he is secretly blight to the Wayne Powers Industries board, and then he takes his place as CEO of the company. But the son goes one step further and tries to kill him so that he can inherit all that his father owns. And he does this by having a machine built that can drain all of the radiation from Derry Power's body. And to Batman's credit, when his son does try to kill him, he tries his best to stop it, as he wants Derek Powers to face justice, not an execution. But ultimately, it didn't matter, as Blight loses control of his powers in a mindless rage at both his son and Batman, and essentially explodes like a mini nuclear reactor. Now, this is a powerful death in the Batman show, and it symbolizes the end of a chapter in Batman's life, as all those responsible for his father's murder are now gone. And it's important to note that a lesser man would stop being Batman after this, as he has gotten revenge on all those who are responsible for his father's death. But Terry still stays on as Batman so that he can help others. 
showing that he isn't Batman for selfish reasons, but because he genuinely cares about the citizens of Gotham City. Number 2. The Joker Now this is one of the best deaths in an animated DC film, and an absolutely beautiful scene to watch unfold. In the TV series Batman Beyond, the Joker never really comes up, apart from the Joker gangs, who are criminals who dress like clowns, but they don't have any real connection to the original Joker. We're the Jokers! Sure you are. And the reason that he is never mentioned in the series is because he is dead, and more importantly, died in a way that rocked the Bat family to its core. With his last act of cruelty, the Joker had tainted us all with compromise and deception. Essentially what leads up to the Joker's death is that he has kidnapped Robin, the Tim Drake version, and he then tortures and mind washes Robin until he thinks he is the Joker's son. And when Batgirl and Batman arrive to rescue him, they find it rather difficult because Tim Drake is now on the Joker's side. And in the ensuing fight after this, the Joker manages to get the upper hand on Batman, and he then orders Tim Drake to kill him. But killing Batman is an extreme act for the once Robin, and Tim Drake fights against this with all his will. But he can't stop himself from pulling the trigger, so instead of shooting Batman, he shoots the Joker through the chest, killing him. And this scene is very powerful, and oddly enough, not the only Joker death in the movie. The movie actually has two versions of deaths for the Joker. The first is the one that I've just described, which is more graphic, while the second death was for a more tame cut of the film. Personally, I think the graphic one is better, as we see the mind warped Tim Drake manage to break free of his mind washing and torture that Joker had inflicted on him. And it's a fitting end for the Clown Prince of Crime, with a poetic justice that sees his victim take the Joker down, which never would have happened if the Joker hadn't abducted Tim Drake in the first place, which means he actually engineered his own death, and it does give it a certain irony as well. And to be fair, the second, more tame death does have a certain poetry to it as well, as Tim Drake pushes the Joker backwards into the devices that the Joker used to torture him, and the Joker actually kills himself by tripping and then reaching for something to steady himself and inadvertently pulling the lever that was used to electrify Tim Drake. So he is killed with the very instrument of Robin's torture. As I said, there is a certain poetry to it. And I do actually think that both of these deaths are quite good, but I think the uncensored one is definitely the better of the two especially with Tim Drake's haunting laughter that slowly turns into tears. It really makes this scene. <laughs> and this entire scene of the movie is beautifully tragic, and most of you would probably say it does actually deserve the number one spot on this list. And it almost did, but I had to bump it down to second place because there was one other death that I thought beat it, and it's from my favourite episode of Batman Beyond that's called Meltdown. Number 1. Mr. Freeze As I said, Derek Power's radiation levels were increasing with his temper, and because of this, the skin he used to cover his body was burning away faster and faster. It's useless. It barely lasts a day anymore. And so, one of his attempts to fix this so that he didn't need the skin anymore was to clone himself a new body. Of course, this is a very risky and experimental procedure, so they decide to try it on someone else first, someone whose DNA was also mutated to such a great extent. Enter Mr. Freeze. Now, Mr. Freeze was exposed to chemicals in the lab that made him immortal. He would never age a day, but he would still die if he left a sub-zero temperature environment. And further to this, his body later began to essentially eat itself, and by the time the doctors were able to stop this, Mr. Freeze was left as just a head without a body. But he is still alive, and will remain so forever, unless things get too hot. So Freeze really has nothing to lose at this point. I mean, who wants to spend eternity as just a head? And since he also has drastically altered DNA, if they can clone a new body for him successfully, then they can definitely do the same for Derek Powers. Obviously, the whole point of this is that the new body is made from mutated DNA, because they want to take out the mutated parts and just make a normal baseline human, basically creating a body that's no longer a metahuman so they can get on with their lives as normal. And so the procedure goes ahead and is a radical success. Mr. Freeze has a full body again, and he no longer has to stay in a sub-zero environment, and so Mr. Freeze decides to get on with a normal life. Though unfortunately, ghosts from his past soon emerge, as a man whose family was killed by Mr. Freeze decides to get revenge and kill Freeze himself. Which, although understandable, is still very illegal, and so Batman steps in to stop the would-be assassin. 
though Freeze decides that he doesn't want to press charges as he's hurt the man enough already. And it is worth noting at this point that it's not explained why Mr. Freeze isn't in prison. After all, he has done a lot of very illegal things over the years, including murdering this man's family. I can only assume that he was let out for time served or he just got off on some sort of insanity plea. But all I can say for sure is that he isn't in prison in the show, even though he probably should be. But anyway, after Freeze is attacked by this man and realizes the damage that he's done to him, he decides to start a charity to help his previous victims recover, using his own savings of over half a billion dollars to fund it. And it all looks like he's returning to the side of the angels and trying to make amends for his villainous past. But sadly, life has other plans, as his body begins to revert to Freeze's previous state, meaning that the cloning wasn't 100% successful and that the damage to Freeze's DNA wasn't entirely removed. And so he once again can no longer survive out of a sub-zero temperature environment. Now, at this point, they really should have just tried again and see if they could improve the process on the next clone, which is of course why Freeze returns to the lab for help and treatment. But Derek Powers and his doctor have other plans. If only we could biopsy his organs at this stage. That might be doable. And so they try to kill him. And then they discover why he was one of Batman's most powerful enemies, as he escapes from the lab with relative ease. Now, Mr. Freeze had attained everything that he wanted. A normal body, a normal life, and a second chance to start over once again. And then he had had all of it stripped away from him, just like he had his life stripped away all those years ago when the lab accident had first turned him into Mr. Freeze. And having that happen to you would mess anyone up. But Mr. Freeze is not anyone. And so he goes and gets the best Mr. Freeze suit that's ever been made. And he gets his revenge, freezing both the doctor who tried to kill him and Derek Powers who ordered the kill. And then he sets the compound to explode, killing everyone who's there, himself included. Now, getting revenge on the people who tried to murder you, that I understand but blowing up the compound would kill a lot of innocent people who had nothing to do with any of this. And so Batman has to stop him, something which is easier said than done. Meanwhile, Derek Powers is using his radiation metahuman abilities to melt through his fake skin and melt the ice around him. And he then goes and attacks Freeze with his radiation, something which is even more lethal to Freeze than it is to an ordinary person, because if Mr. Freeze gets too hot, he dies. But again, this is the supervillain Mr. Freeze, and so he deals with powers directly. And then he lays on the ground and waits to die. Batman does actually try to save him, but he refuses. The whole place is gonna go. Believe me, you're the only one who cares. And with an ice wall in the way, Batman can only leave him there to die, all alone. It's a tragic and sad story of loss that we can actually relate to in some aspects of our own lives. Not the mad scientist and superhero power parts, but the parts about losing our lives and losing our loved ones, that anyone can relate to. And that is why I think it's the best death in Batman Beyond. It's a tragic story as Freeze has to continue on for all those years alone as just a head in a freezer, with some hope that must be keeping him alive as he doesn't seem to have tried to kill himself, until finally he gets everything that he wants and then he loses all of it. And that's too much for him, and it squashes whatever hope was left inside of him. And he says, enough is enough. And he chooses to end his own life on his own terms once and for all. I absolutely love revenge stories. And as Bruce Wayne says, Mr. Freeze lives for revenge. And this ending for him couldn't be any better. And Mr. Freeze did have the saddest origin story in Batman the Animated Series. Yes. It would move me to tears if I still had tears to shed. And as it went on, his story just got sadder and sadder. Originally, his wife had a disease and she was shortly going to die. So he was forced to put her in cryostasis to keep her alive. And after years of being in cryostasis, she is eventually cured and unfrozen. But then Freeze's body destroys itself, so he can't be with her. And then as time passes, he is just stuck as a head in a jar, while she and everyone else in the world is freely living their lives. And that is enough to drive anyone to suicide. Now, as I said, I know a lot of you would say that Joker's death was the better one. And if that's how you feel, then please let us know in the comments. But I think we can all admit that Freeze's death is still one of the best there is. And in my mind, it is definitely the best death in Batman Beyond. And I'd just like to say a quick thank you to those who made this video 